So, as I mentioned, you guys are going to end up next December sometime with something that's about yay thick. <coughs> and you may be thinking to yourself, in an educational leadership program that, in theory, is designed to prepare folks after they've already gotten their initial administrative certification, because again, the six year is designed to be done after the 092, um, you know, why you have to do a research project that is going to take you 12 months and that is going to be incredibly time intensive and incredibly work intensive and is going to essentially result in a five chapter book. So, you know, that's really what a thesis is a five chapter book. Um, just a quick question how many of you? have had an administrator, or for that matter, a teacher educator, at some point in time, tell you that you should focus your instruction with your own students based upon the student's individual learning style. All right. Perfect. Because they were all full of crap. Plain and simple. There is no reliable or valid research whatsoever that indicates that learning styles exist, and even if they did exist, there is no reliable or valid way to actually measure them. So you might as well modify your instruction based upon the circumference of your students' heads, or you know the distance between their two ears, or their hair color, or their eye color, because that's as reliable and valid as trying to figure out how to teach based upon their learning style. And if you think about it, how do we figure out, I mean, because many of you have probably at some PD session that some dumb administrator at some point in time forced you to do, have probably had to complete a learning styles inventory. How did they figure out what type of learner you were? It's not a rhetorical question. Survey. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you had this thing that, you know, <clears throat> either gave you a particular statement and asked you to select four words based upon, you know, how reflective that statement was, or there was some kind of Likert kind of measure, you know, that was designed to measure that. I can guarantee you, and I've got probably a dozen of them sitting on my desk at home, I could have brought one in tonight and given them all to you. And if I came back a month from now and given you the exact same one without telling you what the results were, I can guarantee, without a doubt, Every single person in here would end up with different results. It's based entirely upon self-report. Self-report is notorious, notoriously unreliable because it's largely based upon, A, your own self-perceptions, and, oddly enough, your own mood at the particular time you've taken it. In much the same way that I'm willing to bet one or more of these terms you've come across, in your own teaching that administrators have probably told you that our students today are one of these things and they would have talked about these four people in relation to whichever one they picked and if you knew at the time you could tell your administrators back then that well you know you're full of it because none of these things here are based upon any good research if you look at Mark Prensky's idea of digital natives that's not even based upon any research at all Mark Prensky is a popular author who basically wrote this, uh, well, the idea of digital natives actually came from an article that he wrote in an online journal where he postulated that because students today have grown up in an environment where technology is pervasive, that they are native to digital technology in much the same way that someone who's born into a country is native in terms of their ability to speak a language that is spoken in that country. And that if you were to move to a country that spoke that language and you didn't speak it initially, while you may at some point in time be able to gain some facility with that language, you would never have the command of that language that a native would have. So in theory, all of us in the room, well, most all of us in the room, would be digital immigrants and all the people that we have, you know, those little minions that are running around, or I guess if you're in high school, maybe those big minions that are running around, would all be digital natives. It's based on no research whatsoever. In fact, all of the research that's looked into the idea of digital natives and digital immigrants have found quite the opposite, actually. That most youth today have a surface level understanding of technology, but their ability to actually use technology in pervasive and useful ways is quite limited. Tapscott, when he came up with this idea of the digital generation, 
It was based on surveys that he conducted. Now, surveys in and of themselves aren't necessarily bad things, but the surveys that he used were circulated uh, when he did his original study, so when he wrote the book Growing Up Digital. They were actually circulated primarily along MySpace. You know, that's like walking around Times Square and asking people, you know, who the best hockey team in the NHL is. You know, you're not likely going to get many people that say the Montreal Canadiens, who happen to be my team. You know, it's obviously a skewed sample. I mean, you ask a bunch of people who are online, and particularly if you think about the nature of people who would have been online when MySpace was the thing to be on. What type of characteristics would they have in the first place? And are they necessarily representative of the full range of youth that you would have had? Similarly with Howland Strauss, this idea of millennials. Anyone here familiar with Fairfax, Virginia? One part, two people? Three people? Basically, it's, well, it's just outside D.C., Crystal City. Um, you know, it's pretty much where most of the intelligence and defense community is located. Um, it is the third highest uh, socioeconomic status zip code in the entire United States. The average household has two parents that are working and have graduate level educations. The entire concept of millennials as a generational label was based upon a survey of 1,100 kids in Fairfax, Virginia. Not exactly representative of the type of kids you'd find, I don't know, in Bridgeport maybe, or, you know, in Detroit, where I used to work. A whole group of people, particularly educational folks, who are, in all honesty, too ignorant to know the difference, thinking that we need to adapt how we treat this particular generation based upon this incredibly skewed sample. Yeah. I say all of that because when you look at the idea of spending 12 months to do a quite heavily intensive research topic. It is really designed to get you into having the ability to not just be able to consume research in an intelligent and critical way, but as future leaders to be able to have your staff or for yourself to be able to design and conduct research. You know, every single one of you work in a school that likely has some kind of action plan you know, school improvement plan or whatever logo, label they put on it. There's, off, there's going to be, depending on the plan, I don't know, anywhere from three to, in some cases, a dozen different things, goals that you have for the coming year or for the next three years or five years, depending on how your school and your district sets it up. In theory, they should be measurable things that you are collecting data on and ideally a robust level of data to determine whether or not you're meeting those goals. Wouldn't it be great if it was actually designed in such a way that the outcomes are going to be reliable and valid? As opposed to, you know, the kind of pseudoscience that many of you have probably been exposed through most of your educational careers um, by the folks that are leading you? Wouldn't it be great if you guys could break that chain at some point? You know, and that's really sort of the main reason why we do this. For example, if you look at these 11 things, these are 11 interventions, some of them at the structural level or at the school level, some of them at um, the individual or class level. If you were to rank these things, and take a second there amongst your tables now, not necessarily individually, but there are 11 things up there. If you were to put those things in order from the thing that had the most positive impact or the greatest effect upon student learning, what would that order look like? In case you're wondering, it's a little <coughs> tricky because I didn't actually, whoops, I didn't actually change the order. That's actually the order that they have. And that's the actual effect size of each of those particular things. Just in case you're wondering, in terms of, I guess, what those numbers mean on the outside, and again, I've got, this will be up in Blackboard, so You'll have the slides up there um, shortly after class tonight. Um, so you'll actually be able to have those numbers. But just in case you are wondering, the numbers actually come from a line of research that this guy John Hattie has done, H-A-T-T-I-E. If you haven't heard of him before, uh, one of those four books, and in all likelihood I would suggest probably this one, should be on your bookshelf. If it's not, um, buy it and buy it today. It will be the most useful book. Well, 
this one or this one, but this one's more targeted to teachers, this one's more targeted to researchers. Um, but they're all just called visible learning something or other. Um, this will, in my opinion, is something we should hand to all prospective educators in their very first class. You should not be able to be subjecting yourself to students unless you've got this book in hand first. And the reason for it is because it is probably the best evidence that we have on what actually has a meaningful impact upon learning. Um, for those of you who are interested, uh, Hattie is actually a uh, Kiwi, spent most of his career at the University of Auckland, or I think he's at Monash University, not in Australia. So this idea of visible learning, and the white version of the book is probably the best in terms of understanding what this research is all about, whereas the blue version is best for this is what it means for teachers. Um, so f as you all folks, as potential educational leaders, either of these two I think are quite useful in all honesty. There's not enough duplication between the two that both wouldn't be somewhat useful to you. Essentially what Had he has done in his work is he has taken all of these meta-analysis, um, which is a particular type of study, um, actually he's taken roughly, uh, I think it's 837 he's up to now, um, over a 15-year period that account for 143 different variables that impact student learning. And he has taken all of these particular studies and combined them to figure out what actually does have a meaningful impact upon how students learn. Um, so the whole idea of a meta-analysis is, so the whole idea behind a meta-analysis, and this is one that one of my colleagues, Kathy Cavanaugh, did, but essentially what you do is you take all of these individual studies. So in this case here, I think it's 13 or 14 studies that looked at, in the case of Kathy's, how students did in a distance ed environment compared to how they did in a face-to-face -face environment. So each of these studies has you know, a couple of hundred students in it. What Kathy does, and what every meta-analysis author will do, is she will take these 14 studies and combine them to create an effect size. Right? So essentially creating a result that has a higher degree of statistical power, which means that it is a more reliable and valid result than just an individual study. Because in theory, each of these studies will have certain limitations. When you combine them all together, the limitations should equal out each other because things like um, potential problems with randomization of the sample, you know, all of those things, as you increase the sample size, um, start to essentially iron itself out. What Hattie has done is he's taken over 800 of these, which represents some 50,000 of these, representing some, I think it's, he's up to like six or seven million students that have been sampled through all of these individual studies. So what he's come up with is essentially, if you will, it's like a super effect size to determine how students will do. And once you have that number of studies that you're looking at, and you have that number of variables that you're looking at, you can start to notice some trends. The first trend that he notices is that the average student will improve approximately 0 0.15 effect size just by sitting in the classroom of an average teacher for a year. So essentially, by getting a year older and a year wiser, they are going to improve approximately 0 0.15. A good teacher will have approximately, or what Hattie will call the teacher effect, will have approximately a 0.25 effect size. So by having a child sit in the class of an average teacher for a year, the child will move approximately 0.4 effect size in terms of their level of performance from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Now what that should tell you automatically is that in order for us as educators to decide whether or not we're going to invest time and money into any kind of intervention, be it in the individual classroom or within the school at sort of a structural level or how we organize our schools or at the district level or even throughout the state. You really want to have that point four or higher. 
You know, because let's face it, if I can stick a kid in a room of an average teacher for a year and they're going to go that far, why would I waste $400,000 on some program that's only going to have a 0.3 effect size or a 0.2 effect size? Right? I want something that's going to be up here. So if you're looking at things that are at the top of the list, you know, things that really have a meaningful impact upon student learning, you know, this is what you're looking at. You know, so, and Hattie actually, I think it's in the second appendix in this one. I've never actually pot, paid attention to where it is in the, um, in the other one. But in appendix B in this one, he will go through and list all 142 conditions and tell you what the effect size is, um, tell you if the domain is at the student level, meaning something that the students can do themselves, something that the teacher can do, or something that can be done at the curriculum or school level, which in theory would be done above your heads or in the domain of an educational leader. The interesting thing is if you notice the stuff that's at the top of the list, um, this is Hattie's little logo for teacher over here, the guy in front of the blackboard, you notice that over half of them are things that the teacher has direct control over. And for that matter, if you want to take it a step further, something like this, while it's not something that the teacher does, it is something that the teacher sets up within their class. These are things that actually have a meaningful impact <coughs> upon student learning. Now, obviously, some of them are going to be structural in nature. For example, depending on how your class and how your school is set up, smaller class sizes generally mean less of this. Smaller class sizes generally mean the ability to do more of this or more of this. You know, so not necessarily saying that structural issues don't play a role in that. You know, but if you actually look at the idea of just decre decreasing class sizes and doing nothing else, the effect size is something like 0.3. Or 0.23, I think, 0.26, somewhere in that range. You know, because if all you're doing is decreasing the number of students and you're not making any other changes, it's not going to have that much of an effect. If you decrease the number of students and then the teacher starts to do some of these things, then you start to see a significant increase in the effect that you can have. You know, and this is important. You know, it's important that you understand this. It's important that you be able to you know, discern these kind of things. Because, you know, let's face it, most of our administrators, and hopefully you won't become this kind of administrator, but, you know, they will come across some book like this over the summer. Or, well, here's Growing Up Digital by Tapscott, or another one by Prensky. You know, but they'll come across something like this over the summer. And, you know, some popular author, although, and this is where they'll get their ideas from. And, you know, someone in this district office will, you know, then purchase copies of whatever this book is and send it off to all their administrators, and then they'll end up doing that throughout all of the schools, and they'll just assume that whatever that particular thing is, because this book says that it works, it's going to work in all of your situations. You want to have the ability to be able to critically analyze these kinds of things, to be able to understand, you know, that there is this kind of research out there, and does this research look like the kinds of things that these guys are presenting? Not just because you want to become, you know, a pain in the neck of your current administrators, but in an ideal world, you want to become not like the ones that you have now when you get the opportunity to become educational leaders. You know, you want to be able to say to all of your staff, you know, read this book over the summer, for example, because it will make you a better teacher. Well, not just reading it, but actually implementing the things that are in here, obviously. Again, to pull out the items that are most useful to you, if you're looking at it, I can say with a high degree of certainty, if you were able to do these things in your class, because these are all teacher impacted kind of things, it would lead to better outcomes for your students. At least the research says that it would lead to better outcomes for your students. And not just this sort of generic, oh, the research says this, you know, a high level of statistical analysis that has a great deal of statistical power behind it says that these things will have a meaningful impact in your class.